Hi, I'm Jeff Hirsch, and this is How to Talk About Pictures, a primer in visual literacy. This presentation is an attempt to define the basics of a visual vocabulary that we can use to talk about photographs in a more articulate and expressive manner. It is intended more as a jumping off point for deeper conversations about photography, so it is neither exhaustive nor exclusive. A picture really is worth a thousand words. But photography is a purely visual medium, and every photograph that is taken involves a series of technical and aesthetic choices that the photographer must make. One of the best ways to advance our skills as photographers is to learn a visual vocabulary that can be used to discuss, in plain English, the various choices that go into making a photograph. These choices can include technical aspects of photography like aperture, shutter speed, ISO, lens choice, use of filters, and more, but they also include aesthetic choices like composition, tone and contrast and color, framing, perspective and point of view, balance, emotion, mood, and more. This program offers a basic visual vocabulary that can be used by photographers who are trying to find words to describe their images, as well as judges and jurors who are called upon to give critiques of those images. I want to start by laying out a photographic vocabulary we can all use in common, a way to understand each other when we talk in words about something that is otherwise very visual in nature. One of the best books I have found on photographic vocabulary and commentary is called Photographically Speaking, and it's by David Duchemin. It's been the unofficial handbook of our camera club salon gatherings since they first started, and we've quoted from it extensively on several occasions to broaden the vocabulary of the attendees and get them to think and speak a little more deeply and articulately about the images that they are seeing. We begin the discussion with a quote from the introduction to David's book because I think it nicely frames the situation that we often find ourselves in. He writes, As photographers, we frequently have difficulty speaking about images because, frankly, we don't know how to think about them. And if we don't know how to think about a photograph and its visual language, how an image is constructed, how it works, and why it works, then when we're behind the camera, are we really making images that best communicate our vision, our original intent? Vision, crucial as it is, is not the ultimate goal of photography. Expression is the goal. And to best express ourselves, it is necessary to learn and use the grammar and vocabulary of the visual language. And that's our launching point for today's presentation. Now, it may not be completely intuitive at first, but the visual world that we inhabit as photographers is ultimately made up of words, those handy linguistic tools that give our minds labels and names for everything that our senses perceive. The more diverse and accurate words that we have to describe this world, the more accurately we can depict and represent it. The same is true with photographs, of course. I've divided our vocabulary into two basic categories of words that describe what is present in the photos we are examining. One we will call photographic elements, and the other we will call photographic decisions. Photographic elements are the visual inventory of what is actually present in an image. The lines, curves, shapes and forms, patterns and textures and tones that are visible or implied, as well as the quality, shape, color, and direction of the light that illuminates those various elements. Photographic decisions refer to the myriad variety of options that were specifically chosen by the photographer when making the image. These include obvious choices like shutter speed, aperture, ISO, and focal length, along with less obvious choices like framing, 
cropping, orientation, aspect ratio, perspective and point of view, balance and proportion, and timing of the moment. Cultivating an awareness of both the elements that are visible and the decisions that were made to express those elements in any given photograph will not only make you a more constructive commentator, it will also make you a better photographer. These are the basic visual elements we find in photographs. All photographs contain one or more of these simple building blocks. And for the next several slides, we will look more closely at examples to illustrate each of these elements. At this point in the conversation, we are only concerned with the what of a photograph, what we are actually seeing. In a little while, we will concern ourselves more with the why or the how of a photo when we talk about the various decisions the photographer made when capturing the image. But for now, it's our job to articulate and analyze what we are seeing without just giving an inventory or stating the obvious. It's a picture of a flower. It's a picture of a car. We must be able to talk in greater detail about the fundamental visual elements present in a photograph and how they contribute to the success or failure of the image. Here then is a incomplete inventory of photographic elements that appear in a picture and a few ideas on how you might further describe an image that contains such elements. One of the most basic visual elements, of course, is the, the line. And lines can have a shape. We have straight lines and we have curved lines. Horizontal lines tend to draw our eyes back and forth across an image from left to right. Vertical lines tend to draw our eyes up and down across an image from top to bottom. Diagonal lines bring a sense of dynamic visual motion or action to an image. Curved lines draw the viewer's eye through the image in a more gentle fashion. S-curves and spirals are particularly pleasant to the eye. Lines can also have a quality. Lines can be long or short, thick or thin, delicate or bold, they can be of uniform or varied thickness. They can be solid lines or broken up. They can be straight or curved. They can be undulating or zigzagging. They can run in parallel or perpendicular to each other. Ming Thien wrote this about the importance of lines in photographs. We pattern recognize the line, whether explicitly solid or implied by a sequence of staccato objects, and follow it to the terminus. It is not something you can easily consciously control. Our brains are just wired that way. It is therefore important to be aware of this when photographing to both actively use the line to draw the attention of the audience to a desired element in the composition, as well as avoid unintentionally misleading to an unimportant element. These visual flow lines can cancel out or reinforce each other in a way much the same as vectors in conventional physics or math, except here the magnitude of the vector is analogous to the visual weight and is determined by contrast and color. One very important thing to note is that in almost all cases, the resultant net vector follows the orientation of the frame, more likely to be vertical for portrait and horizontal for landscape. Anything else frequently results in empty space and visual imbalance. Let's move beyond the line to more complex shapes. We tend to divide shapes into two categories, organic and geometric. Organic are more freeform or natural shapes like leaves, clouds, flowers, 
geometric are based on the basic shapes of geometry, circles, triangles, squares, cylinders, cubes, spheres, and more. Shapes and forms also have various qualities to them. They can be large or small, organic or geometric, two-dimensional or three-dimensional. They can be symmetrical or asymmetrical. We can see them in singular or repeating form. In fact, we can repeat shapes and forms to create patterns, patterns of lines, patterns of shapes, even patterns of colors. Here's a repeating asymmetrical organic form. Here's a repeating organic form that has a radial symmetry to it. Here's a non-repeating organic form that's asymmetrical when you look at it from the side, but symmetrical if you're looking from the front. In this case, we have a geometric repeating form that has both a pattern of shapes and a pattern of colors. And in this example, we have an organic, non-repeating, asymmetrical set of shapes and forms. Another photographic element to discuss is texture. Textures bring detail and a sense of tactile response to your photographs. Like many of the other elements we have discussed, texture has many different qualities. Smooth or rough, hard or soft, solid or broken, woven, lumpy, jagged, ridged. Textures can be flat and polished and smooth. They can be raised and rough and coarse, cut, incised, pitted, scratched, and uneven. They can be hairy and sticky and shiny and glossy and reflective. We often describe photographic prints in terms of the texture of the paper they are printed on. Glossy, semi-gloss, satin, matte, pearl. Next, I'd like to discuss the interrelated elements of tone and contrast. Tone, or value, is the range of light to dark shades that are present in an image, the blacks, whites, and shades of gray in between if we're talking about a monochrome image. But tone applies to color images in, as well. In the case of color, tone isn't just a luminance value, it also includes a hue and a saturation. When considering an image, ask yourself what tonal range is present in the images. Blacks, whites, shadows, highlights and midtones? Are the tones flat and uniform, unvarying, smooth and plain, or are they varied and broken? Are the tones graduated or contrasting? And while we are talking about tone, let's also talk about contrast. Contrast is the difference in luminance between the brightest and the darkest tones in your image. The greater the difference, the higher the contrast. So when considering an image, ask yourself what kind of contrast is present in the images. Are they high contrast, like this example image where there's a great difference between the brightest and darkest elements in the photo? Are they low contrast? Like this example image, where the difference between the lightest and the darkest elements is very slight, resulting in a much flatter, lower contrast image. Now we reach a term that goes beyond being just a basic visual element and verges into the more creative, subjective, storytelling and artistic aspects of an image. That is the concept of juxtaposition. Well, simply put, juxtaposition is the inclusion of two or more elements that contrast strongly with each other in a visual or 
a conceptual fashion, you're holding a spotlight to the differences. You might juxtapose young and old, warm and cool, then and now, near and far, big and small, size and scale. You might juxtapose formal and informal. Supermodel Claudia Schiffer juxtaposed with a little old lady in Leipzig. Modern tourists on the left and a Roman centurion on the right. The sublime beauty of a pair of twins at Carnivale and the less sublime view of a Teletubby in the background. The possibilities for juxtaposition in your images are as endless as your imagination. Another basic photographic element is color itself. When describing the colors of an image, we can go further than just calling them out by name, red, blue, green, etc. We can describe the quality of those colors and how they affect an image. We can describe qualities of color in a variety of ways. Of course, we can discuss color versus monochrome, but we might also describe colors as being primary, like red, yellow, and blue, or secondary, like orange, green, and purple, that are combinations of primary colors. Colors can be warm, like the ones on the yellow and orange end of the spectrum. They can be cool, like those colors on the blue end of the spectrum, or colors can even be neutral in the middle. Colors can be complementary or analogous to each other, depending on their position across the color wheel. They can be vivid or dull, pale or saturated, muted or bold, natural or synthetic. We have such rich language to describe the colors in our images. Our colors can be natural, clear, compatible, distinctive, interesting, lively, stimulating, subtle and sympathetic. Colors can also be artificial, clashing, depressing, discordant, garish, gaudy, jarring, unfriendly, even violent. They can be bright and brilliant and deep. They can be earthy, harmonious and intense, rich and saturated, strong and vibrant and vivid, but they can also be dull and flat, insipid, pale, mellow, muted, subdued, quiet, even weak. They can be cool and cold. They can be warm and hot. They can be lighter and darker. You might have blended, broken, mixed, muddled, or muddied colors, and you might have pure colors. You might find ones that are complementary, contrasting, or even harmonious. There's a lot of language to describe color. One of the most important aspects of photographic composition is the concept of proportion, the relationship of elements to each other and the relationship of elements to the overall composition, how they are placed, what is emphasized or de-emphasized. This is all about arranging space, typically a two-dimensional representation of the three-dimensional world you're looking at. Think of the scene before your camera as taking place in a three-dimensional box. We must consider the placement of elements along all three axes, left to right, top to bottom, and front to back. We are visually arranging items within this 3D space when we compose our photographs. Consider the arrangement, layout, structure, and position of the elements in your photos. Consider depth and layering of elements, foreground, middle ground, and background. Consider choices that visually separate the subject from your background so that your image doesn't appear flat and has some depth and dimensionality to it. Ming Thien says the following about foreground and background relationships. 
you see so many images that have distracting elements that break the flow of a composition, and frequently the reason an attractive element or subject failed to translate into an attractive photograph, something distracted the audience and in turn broke concentration on the subject. It is therefore necessary to move from the subject first process of composition to considering the background structure and subjects in tandem, plus of course the implied relationship between them and the casual flow suggested by the background. In fast moving situations, he says, I find it necessary to almost be continuously aware of the background, contextual elements contained within, light direction, and only then actively look for a subject suitable to my narrative intent to place within that stage. It is, of course, necessary to leave an opening in the stage for the actor, too. Now, this very much echoes the philosophy of the great National Geographic photographer Sam Abel, who always composes his scenes in layers from back to front, always starting with the farthest away element of the background and working his way forward until he locates where he wants his subject to be placed within that entire scene. His motto is compose and wait. And as such, he composes an entire stage and then waits for the actor to arrive. Sometimes it's a person or an animal moving into the scene. Sometimes it's a change of light. But whatever that special element is, he has already accounted for everything else in the scene, so there are none of the distracting elements Ming was talking about. His subject will come through clearly. The elements you place in the scenes you compose can be centered, asymmetrically or symmetrically. They can be balanced or unbalanced. They can be very lopsided. Those elements can be overlapping and cluttered and chaotic. They can be spacious and separate and empty with a lot of breathing room between them. They can be free and flowing and fragmented. They can be formal and rigid and upright and confined. Consider also the use of negative and positive space within that composition. Using proportion and composition, you can convey a sense of scale, like this rather large hand with this normal-sized human being. In fact, although we can't say that there are any hard and fast rules, some proportions do feel more balanced and interesting than others do. Take, for example, the sets or proportions you see on the left. If we divide our proportions up too evenly, it's a little boring and monotonous. You may have heard the suggestion that you don't evenly divide your sky and your foreground as giving equal weight to both sort of cancels out the importance of either one over the other. But likewise, if we create a division that is too unequal, there's a lack of harmony and our divisions don't feel quite natural. If you look at the proportions represented on the right half side of the slide, we can have a more equal division or a more unequal division that feels more proportional or harmonious. And of course, one of the most common sets of proportion and compositions we hear about in the photographic world is this idea of the so-called rule of thirds. And I would agree that there is some truth to the idea that if you place important elements at any of those intersecting points, often referred to as crash points or power points, that those do tend to be more visually compelling than if you had placed that element either too far to the edge or too close to the center. In fact, my favorite way of composing using this so-called rule of thirds is to use what they call the golden ratio. And that is also known as the tight rule of thirds. And to me, I find the proportions that I get when composing along this grid are even more compelling than the ones that I would get if I used the standard rule of thirds. Now let's talk about balance. Well, balance within an image affects the overall harmony and if the viewer is going to perceive the image as orderly or chaotic. Images can be balanced or unbalanced. 
They can be symmetrically or asymmetrically balanced. Now, there is no hard and fast right or wrong, but there is a sense with most viewers of which images have more or less balance to them. So in this first example, we have a symmetrically balanced image. This image is more asymmetrically balanced. Symmetrically balanced, asymmetrically balanced. This one's very symmetrical, right down the middle. This one's balanced, but in a more asymmetrical fashion. The same with this one, where the tall, slender lighthouse is helping to balance out the shorter, broader pink building. This photograph is symmetrical across the horizontal axis reflecting above to below, but on the vertical axis, it's entirely asymmetrical. And in this image, I think without the two shadowed figures on the right, it would be more unbalanced. By having there, they kind of balance out the two darker figures on the left, and the image has a bit more harmony to it. Possibly the most important element for us to be able to articulate in photography is light itself. Light has a shape, a color, a direction, and a quality. And in the case of this wonderful image from 2013 by fine art photographer Lucas Zimmerman, every one of those aspects is there for us to describe. Shape. Well, we have conical shaped light that's emanating from each of the stoplights. Direction, it's going straight out from the two side lights and it's angled down from that top light. Color, well, red, yellow, and that sort of bluish green that we see. And we can even describe the quality of these lights. They are intense and focused near the stoplights and they become more diffuse and softer and spread out the farther the light travels from the source. I'll often describe light like this as having a volumetric quality to it because you can actually see the volume of space that light fills up the same way, say, red wine would fill the volume of a crystal clear wine glass. In this case, you can see the diffuse, expanding cones of light created by each of the colors in the stoplights. Practice seeing and describing the shape, direction, color, and quality of light in your environment. Learn the very basic terms for shadows and highlights and reflected light. The light in your images can be dim, faint, gentle, gloomy, low, minimal, muted, soft and diffused and indirect. It can also be clear, brilliant, bright, glowing, fiery, harsh, intense, sharp and direct. Learn some of the terms that are used to describe the various elements of light and shadow. Now I want you to close your eyes and imagine in your mind what each of these natural and man-made lights looks like. Each one of them exhibits the basic properties of light, shape and color and direction and quality. Try to envision the following light sources. Let's start with something simple like natural light. Picture a sunset. Think about the color direction, quality, and shape of that kind of light source and how it illuminates a scene. Next, picture a flickering campfire and the light that it might cast and the shadows it might throw on the people sitting around it. Now imagine a field of fireflies blinking at you during twilight. All of these lights have specific looks that we can describe. Now I want you to try and picture some man-made lights. Close your eyes again. Imagine car headlights, a flashlight, paper lanterns, 
fluorescent light bulbs, street lights, glow sticks, LED lights. All of these lights have a specific look that we can describe using the properties of shape, direction, color, and quality. What is the shape, the direction, the color, and the quality of light in this scene? And how does it compare to the shape, direction, and quality and color of the light in this scene? Or this one? Now we reach the most ephemeral and difficult part of photography to describe. Once a picture moves beyond pure documentation, there is something more uniquely human, something creative or artistic that imbues the image with something more than just an inventory of what fell within the frame. To my way of thinking, this is what takes pictures from good to great, from ordinary to extraordinary. And we often know it when we see it as an element in a photograph, but that doesn't mean it's always easy to describe. This is what the great Jay Maisel calls gesture. I like that term and how he describes it. Some people refer to this as impact or emotion or story. It can be a physical gesture like the leap of a dancer, a boxer's punch, or the swing of a bat. But it can also be a face that conveys sadness or joy or wonder or stillness. Maybe it's the quality of how a piece of silk falls across a shaft of light or how water babbles in a stream. These are all different kinds of gestures that we see in images. That little something that makes you linger a moment longer with the image, the gentle tilt of the head or a placement of a hand, that's gesture or what some people might call emotion or impact. In the description below this video, you'll find a link to a brief three-minute video clip of Jay Maisel explaining exactly what he means by this term, gesture. I think it's a good addition to any conversation about photography. The photographic elements that appear in an image are only half of the story. The other half is told by the many different choices and decisions made by the photographer in an effort to express those visual elements in a specific way. These decisions include things like shutter speed, aperture, and ISO, as well as more aesthetic choices like orientation, aspect ratio, proportion, point of view, and more. Even more than the choice of subject itself, these are the decisions that impart a photographer's visual style or voice upon the image. It is the choices of why or how in making a photograph that determine the actual what that we end up seeing with our eyes. So it is here where we can often give the most useful feedback to photographers by offering them other potential choices they might have made in the same situation to get different results. Choice of shutter speed affects motion in a photograph, how still or how blurred that motion will be. Shutter speed can be very fast and freeze the motion, like water droplets in a fountain or flames in a bonfire. Shutter speed can be very slow and stretch out or smear motion, like the taillights or a waterfall. And it can be anywhere in between, though I will say we do tend to notice it more at the extremes of very frozen or very fluid. Next, of course, is aperture, which controls the depth of field. And depth of field is a measure of how much of the image is in focus from front to back. Wider apertures create a shallower depth of field. 
Narrower aperture is the opposite, a deeper depth of field. A wide aperture and shallow depth of field work to isolate a subject in focus while throwing the rest of the image out of focus. A narrow aperture and deep depth of field carries the viewer deeply into and through the scene from front to back. One entire set of choices made by the photographer has to do with focus, and this is very directly related to aperture. How much of the image is in focus and where? And how deep does the focal range go? Images can be sharp, tack sharp as the cliche goes. Images can be soft and deliberately blurry. Focus can be on the entire image or it can just be on one selected area, or even a very narrow band of focus in the case of a tilt-shift lens or a faux tilt-shift processing. Give some thought as to how you might describe the various focal choices you're seeing in an image. One of the most basic choices a photographer can make is exposure, how bright or how dark the scene will be rendered. Images can be deliberately underexposed and they can be deliberately overexposed. Or they can be true to scene and represent a more accurate portrayal of the light values that were present when the image was made. When discussing an image, consider the exposure that the maker has chosen. Consider also how the maker has used internal framing to highlight or isolate or feature or otherwise indicate an element in their picture that they would like to draw your attention to. The frame within the frame tells us where the maker wishes for us to look. Consider the cropping choices that were made or that might be made. Many beginning photographers lack a good sense of cropping and can be greatly helped by a little feedback. Encourage the maker to consider different crops if you think they would suit the image. Maybe cropping in makes for a stronger picture. Maybe it brings us closer to the subject. Maybe there are half a dozen different ways to crop the same image depending on which story you wish to tell. Traditionally, crops have come in the shape of the physical output sizes we had for 35 millimeter film. So we had formats like eight by 10 prints or five by seven. These days, we also have video formats to consider with aspect ratios like four by three or 16 by nine. But the truth is the size and the shape of your picture should not be determined by physical format but by what is best served by the image itself. A wide panoramic aspect ratio is the perfect format for this picture of Sydney Harbor. The basic orientation of a frame has a huge impact on composition, whether it is in landscape or portrait format. It also affects which lines are going to be perceived as more dominant. In a portrait orientation photo, it is the vertical lines that will feel more dominant. And in the horizontal or landscape portrait, it's the horizontal lines, lines that will feel more dominant. Consider also how well suited the orientation is to the subject. As you look at this pair of pictures of horse and rider, it's pretty clear which orientation is a better fit for the subject. Where you stand or sit or lay down or hang out or perch upon when you take a photo determines a great deal about the kind of story you are going to tell the viewer. A strong POV or point of view puts your viewer behind the eyes of the photographer. It shows them what you were seeing when you made the image. 
Think about where the photographer was when the picture was taken and what point of view is being expressed. A very high point of view looking down on the lobby of the Hilton Hotel in Prague. A very low point of view looking edgewise onto the IM Pay Pyramid that's at the entrance of the Louvre. A very specific point of view standing in the median between two directions of traffic on the chain bridge in Budapest. Each one of these conveys a specific perspective or point of view. And when it comes to point of view, I think this photograph is perhaps the most singular and unique image ever made by mankind. It was taken by Apollo 11 astronaut Michael Collins just after the command module had separated from the lunar lander containing Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong. In the foreground, you have the lunar lander with Neil and Buzz inside, making their historic descent to the surface of the moon. In the midground, you have the moon itself, and in the background, the whole Earth with its three plus billion human inhabitants. Contained within this simple frame is every single human being in existence except the photographer Michael Collins himself. And I think that it is the ultimate perspective any human photographer has ever achieved. Moments later, Collins slipped behind the dark side of the moon and was cut off entirely from all of humanity and left alone with only his thoughts. And here's how he described that moment of perspective. I don't mean to deny a feeling of solitude. It is there, reinforced by the fact that radio contact with the Earth abruptly cuts off at the instance I disappear behind the moon. I am alone now, truly alone and absolutely isolated from any known life. I am it. If a count were taken, the score would be three billion plus two over on the other side of the moon, and one plus God only knows what on this side. I feel this powerfully, not as fear or loneliness, but as awareness, anticipation, satisfaction, confidence, almost exultation. I like the feeling. Outside my window, I can see stars, and that is all. Where I know the moon to be, there is simply a black void. The moon's presence is defined solely by the absence of stars. Now that, ladies and gentlemen, is a point of view like no other and worthy including in any conversation about photograph perspective or point of view. And now we reach the decisive moment this is perhaps the most ephemeral and transient part of photography and the one that still holds me with its magic and that is the search for the perfect decisive moment where everything comes together for a picture all of the elements in the frame are exactly where you want them the actors are right on their marks the lights are perfect and the action is frozen at just the right time with the click of a shutter. We get this term from Henri Cartier-Bresson, of course, who coined it, and many of the world's most famous images are marked by their critical, decisive moments. Another entire set of photographic decisions deals with the various optics one can employ when making an image. Along with lens choice, which will determine the field of view and the degree of magnification, there are also optical modifiers like teleconverters and extension tubes and diopter filters. The longer the focal length of the lens, the greater the degree of magnification, but the narrower the field of view. Shorter focal lengths will have less magnification, but a wider field of view. Somewhere around 50 millimeters is the typical field of view that we would see with our own 
eyes. So this focal length is often chosen for its natural appearance to the viewer and the field of view it provides. A few more optical choices we might make. You might employ the use of a teleconverter or extension tubes which can multiply the focal length. Typically, it'll multiply the focal length of your lens by one and a half or two times, giving you an even greater magnification and reach. Or you might use extension tubes or diopter filters to achieve macro results without having to purchase an expensive macro lens. These photos were made with extension tubes and diopter filters, not with a macro lens. This image was made with a traditional macro lens. And when it comes to optical modifiers, the most common ones in day-to-day -day use, of course, are filters. We have UV filters for cutting ultraviolet light. There are polarizing filters for cutting down scattered light reflections in haze that you will get on days where you have bright sunny skies and shiny reflections off of the surface of water. There are neutral density filters which act like sunglasses for your lens and will cut down the amount of light that reaches the sensor and allows you to have much longer exposures. There are also graduated neutral density filters that will reduce the light coming in from one part of the frame while allowing it to pass through another. These are particularly useful when shooting sunrises and sunsets, since the light differences between the foreground and the sky can often be quite stark. Here you can see a series of neutral density filters that have been added to this scene. There are even special effects filters that will color the image, or diffuse the scene that's being captured. One of the most important choices a photographer can make involves the type of lighting being employed and how that light is modified. One can shoot in natural light, man-made light, or a combination of the two. Studio lighting can come from a constant light, from a strobe, or even from a nearby window. Light can be modified using a variety of tools to control the shape, intensity, and quality of the light. It can be concentrated with a snoot or spread out with a diffuser, or a softbox, or a reflector. It can be directed or reflected. It can even be colored using gels over the lighting source. And the modifiers that you choose will change not only the quality of the light that illuminates your subject, but also the quality of the shadows that fall behind it. Here's an example of the same scene as photographed with a variety of light sources and modifiers. The very last thing we need to consider in our discussion of any given photograph is how it was processed. Of course, in this day and age, the maker has limitless options for post-processing we don't have time to discuss even a fraction of them, so I think I'll leave it at this. When considering an image, you may wish to address the post-processing if it is a factor in how the image appears. So that's a brief summary of the elements and the decisions that go into making a photograph. My goal was to provide you with the building blocks for a visual vocabulary. And I hope this expanded awareness will not only allow you to describe other people's photographs in greater and more meaningful detail, but also to be more articulate and deliberate about your own choices as a photographer. And if you are in a position of being asked to critique images, such as for competition judging, it's my hope this conversation will give you better ways to describe what you are seeing. Good critiques discuss why an image is successful and how its component strengths contribute to its overall success. Positive information is a powerful teaching tool. Effective critiquing involves explaining opinions, both positive and negative, in a constructive fashion. Expressing an opinion 
without a supporting explanation is of lesser value because it provides the photographer with little opportunity for learning. Regardless of whether you are judging a competition or just talking about photos with your friends, this expanded visual vocabulary will help you articulate what elements are present in the photograph and what decisions were made by the photographer. Thanks for listening. For more photography tips, tricks, techniques, and tutorials, be sure to visit my website at jeffhirsch.com and don't forget to sign up for the mailing list so I can send you more cool videos and photo education resources. I promise not to spam you or sell your mail to a third party.